Hare Krishna. So today morning, I'll discuss on this topic of the vision that nurtures pure devotion. So how to develop the vision that nurtures pure devotion? I'll take this in three parts, and after each part, we can have a brief pause. If you have any comments or questions, we can discuss. The first part I'll talk is about how. <coughs> we all see the same thing but we don't see the same thing how our vision is different for each person and second part i'll talk is about based on our vision that which is a shelter for one person is a trap for another and last part i'll talk about how we need to intelligently rise from a lower shelter to a higher shelter ultimately to the shelter of krishna so basically relativity of vision then relativity of shelters and the ultimate shelter these are three main topics i'll talk about <coughs> so most of you have probably seen that uh, picture which shows you know, if you look at a picture and from one vision it looks like a young woman another vision it looks like a old woman have you, see, have you seen that picture most of you so you know it's that is not logical that is psychological <laughs> so logically it can either be one this or this but it's it's psychological psychological means each person's mind is different and based on what is there in our mind our vision is shaped accordingly none of us actually studies or looks at the world objectively there is the study of matter and there is the study of what matters so modern science focuses on the study of matter and it's important in its own way but for most of us we focus on what matters right now in this room if we wanted to describe this room we could have describe hundreds of details we could describe the kind of floor that is there the kind of chandeliers that the kind of the kind of roof that is there <laughs> the kind of roof that is there the kind of architecture that is there we could describe so many things we could describe the kind of people which background so now when we when you come to here you focus on the things that matter to you say for example <laughs> if you want to hear this class then you want to sit in a place which is reasonably comfortable a you look around the people who will be sitting next to you you know if you know that some people tend to be distracted or they have their phone on then you will sit away from them if you need a fan you will find out where there is a place below the fan so basically whenever we look at a particular thing in a particular situation we focus on what matters and there are so many other things about that place which we cannot focus on in fact psychologists did some experiment that say at a uh, supermarket counter where people submit a bill and they they and then they pay and then they get the change back along the receipt along with the receipt so in between what they did was they, there was one person sitting over there or uh, and standing at the counter or sitting at the counter and they handed something and then the person dug down and another person came up over there. and almost 90% of people didn't even notice there was a change of person because for them their vision is mostly transaction it's only if say you had given given 1000 rupees and you expected 100 rupees back and you get only get get 50 rupees back then you look hey, why you not give me the money so there the focus is on the transaction and as long as the other person does the transaction well it doesn't matter who the person over there is even if one person goes and other person comes so basically we have a functional or transactional vision of things just like say when we work on a computer now a computer is an incredibly complicated thing now now today an ordinary laptop today has more computing power than what than the 1970s spacecraft which are just said to have gone out to other planet other celestial objects has were having but for us as long as the computer functions now i press in some keys and whatever i want appears over there i press something 
and what I want to be done, get done gets done. So then, that's, then that is the level of perception for us of the computer. So same way with respect to the world at large. Mm -hmm. That when we function in the world, the world is incredibly complicated. And we don't think about any bigger picture or we, we basically could say that there can be a low resolution picture a low resolution picture or low resolution conception is okay i put some and i press some keys and what i want appears on the screen so it's a device which does what i want me to do that's a low resolution picture but if i want a high resolution picture of the computer there are so many gadgets so many chips inside it so many uh, programs inside it so we don't look at a high resolution picture the same way when we function in our life most of us function with a low resolution picture low resolution picture is say that you know, i have got this job and if i go and work over here i get this money this is my family member if i take care of them they will take care of me and this is now why am i calling this a low resolution picture because there are so many other levels of reality which are functional i was at a staying at a devotee's place in america recently and he told me that he had come to India for a fortnight and during that time in his work he got many emails but he said I'm, he had gone to Rindavan other places he said I'm not going to check any emails he said when I go back to work I will go there and I will check so then when he went back to work he went to his office and he found his office only was not there so what happened so during the time when he was away his company had shut down the office had shut down and now something else was there at that place. So we normally, now it's one thing to lose your job, it's one thing to offer the office itself to disappear. <laughs> so now normally we don't think about the economic upheavals or the big picture of a company or the nation. All that is involved. So when we, I was, I was in Australia, a devotee from some Zimbabwe had come over there and he told me about a decade or two ago, the currency of Zimbabwe had devalued so much that once he went to a shop to get some get some bread and he took a bucket full of currency notes and the shopkeeper threw away all the currency notes took the bucket and gave him bread in exchange for the bucket <laughs> so now we consider a currency to be valuable but there are so many other factors which determine the value of the thing. So, uh, we have a functional vision of things. And when things don't function the way we want them to, that's when we start looking at either the bigger picture or the deeper picture or whatever. We alter our vision. Say, if my computer doesn't work, if I give currency and I don't get what I expect back, if I go to my office and there is no office, hey, what's going on? So our functional vision expands or deepens when the functional vision doesn't work. The same way with respect to life at large. Most people don't really think about God much. Don't really think about what is the ultimate purpose of existence? Is there some reality beyond the reality of this world? Most people have a functional vision of life. Maybe about 20 or 25 years ago when I just started practicing bhakti, I was share, sharing the Bhagavad Gita with some of my relatives. So I was telling about the existence of God and logical scientific reasoning for that. So my uncle said that I believe in God. He is happy there, I am happy here. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a function, he let it be there. I, it doesn't matter for me. Mm, I was at an interfaith conference in Washington DC and there from different religions were discussing about how to spiritual how to share may help the youth become more spiritual so one christian pastor was saying what is the prominent conception of of a of a say a christian priest or a pastor depending on catholicism or protestantism right, among the youth so there's one youth who gave a very very intriguing reply he said that a priest what is your conception of a priest? They were asked for the question. They said, a priest is someone who is constantly worried 
that someone somewhere is having some fun <laughs> so their idea is that oh these religious people they tell us don't do this don't do that don't do that they are simply interfering with our enjoyment so if that is the conception they have then why would they want they will not care about god at all so for most people they don't think about god they have a functional vision of life and based on what kind of impression they have like say somebody who is pious okay god is there i am here i don't want no, no need to bother about it i won't bother him he won't bother me or god and religion are simply there to interfere with my enjoyment so i don't want anything to do with them so basically we have a functional vision of life and depending on what kind of conceptions we have acquired god we will see as having some functional role or no functional role in it when we are living in this way it is only when our existing functional vision doesn't work that's when we think of altering expanding or deepening the vision so krishna in the bhagavad gita says that there are four kinds of people who approach him those four kinds are those who are distressed those who are distressed those who are distressed and those who are distressed <laughs> You know, there has to be some basic denominator of dissatisfaction with the world for people to turn towards something higher. Now, Krishna says four kinds: those who are inquisitive, those who seek knowledge, those who are distressed, those who seek wealth. But none of these people necessarily need to come to God, especially in today's world. In one sense. progress means providing people more and more alternatives they do this or do this or do this but if the progress is in a godless context it means providing people more and more alternatives to god so in today's world if somebody is distressed they can go to a psychiatrist they can go here they can go there they can go to a therapist they don't necessarily have to come to god if somebody needs money they will go to a bank for a loan they will not come to god if somebody is inquisitive they can just google and uh, actually i was giving a class in microsoft in <coughs> in seattle so i often give software examples so they told me that if you are going to give a software example don't use the word google <laughs> so, why he said because microsoft promotes bing so they have a different search engine so don't use google name over there <laughs> so everybody has their relative perceptions but anyway we can just search on the internet which our search engine we use but we we don't have to be inquisitive and come necessarily to god so basically when there is some set, some denominator of dissatisfaction or distress so great that the functional vision functional material vision doesn't work that's when we start expanding or deepening our vision to perceive something higher to perceive something deeper so in that sense disruption of our existing situation is required for us to turn towards something spiritual now the disruption can broadly happen in two ways you know our life becomes so distressful as it is right now that it's un- how can i live i need something higher in my life or we have some goals we achieve those goals and after we have achieved those goals we find them unfulfilling no oh, i oh i achieved this i achieved that and still it's there's no satisfaction in this so either we can be frustrated by failure or we can be frustrated by success but when we get some kind of frustration prabhupad gives in a lecture and is talking to hippies in the other lecture so he says that human in all of you hippies are said to be frustrated americans don't appreciate you very much because you are considered to be frustrated people he says but i appreciate all of you so human life is meant to be frustrated it is when we are frustrated then we will inquire about spirituality athato brahma jigyansa so it's interesting you no know, acharya has given this kind of elaboration of this athato brahma jigyansa when will we do brahma jigyansa when we are frustrated with life brahmana acharya in his vedanta sutra commentary has almost a 100 page commentary on this verse and talks about how does the urge for brahma jigyansa come upon so he talks primarily it can come from previous life it can come from this life association 
but whether it is a previous life's inclination or this life association there has to be some frustration at a denominator so this was <coughs> so for all of us to take shelter of god here it is said mai drushte akhilatmani mai drushte drushte is vision that's how what i'm talking about is related with this verse that when will we get this vision that krishna is the akhilatmani the supreme soul the soul who is the soul of all of existence we will seek to get that vision when our current vision doesn't work when in with the current vision when we are functioning in the world something goes wrong with that function that's when we seek to expand that vision so this is the first point i was making that we all have different visions and when our existing vision is disrupted so we see that that's when we turn towards god or at least we intensify our turning towards god and the whole bhagavatam is describing dramatic incidents dramatic incidents where somebody's existing way of living was disrupted parishit maharaj living virtuously but then suddenly he was cursed and he took shelter of the lord it was not that he was not sheltered earlier he was living a devoted life but at that time he took even more intense shelter of the lord prithrasar was living a demoniac life uh, but his because of his body and his conditioning his behavior was demoniac but below the body and its conditioning was the soul and the soul was attracted to krishna based on his previous life some scars and when he faced the imminent death on seeing the uncounterable weapon in the hands of indra that's what in one moment at one if you see the verses in the sixth canto till a particular point he is describing you o indra are bhratra you are the killer of your own brother your guru ha you are dvija ha you are the killer of your guru you are the killer of a brahmana you are killer of a brother i will kill you and then suddenly in one word it changes if however you kill me today then i will give up this body absorb in the remembrance of the lord and as i will transcend this world and suddenly from a very confrontational kshatriya kind of speech his his speech exists become suddenly very transcendental and devotional that's because that functional vision is no longer works he realized this is a weapon i can't fight against so then whatever earlier impressions he had from his previous life they come to the fore gajendra was living a luxurious life and suddenly when he realized that i can't get rid of this crocodile he had a functional vision hey what is this crocodile i'll kick it off how dare it interfere with my enjoyment but he realized he just couldn't kick it off couldn't kick it off tried and tried and tried and when he couldn't finally then narayana khil guru bhagavan namaste he expanded his vision and that's when what he had done in his previous life came back to him so basically the disruption of our present functional vision leads to the expansion of our vision to perceive krishna to perceive the spiritual side of reality so any questions or comments about this yes please Thank you. That's a good example of the eleventh chapter. Uh, Arjuna is 
there are acharyas explained in two different ways at one level if you consider arjuna to be like a human being then to get the darshan of vishwarupa is a elevation of his vision but if you consider arjuna to be an intimate devotee of the lord then from that level to see the universal form is a lower level vision and prabhupad uses a fascinating phrase over there he says a devotee is not interested in such a godless display of opulence now actually god is displaying his opulence and prabhupad is saying this is a godless display of opulence how is that because this is just the show of power is not something which attracts a devotee so thank you beautiful example so yeah give the mic to me Uh, you talked about Vidra Swarup, so I didn't understand that how we uh, switch from functional to devotionalism. What was the reason? Okay. How did Vidra Swarup shift from functional to devotionalism? Vision. Vidra Swarup was fighting at that time, and initially he had overpowered the devotees. The devotees were fleeing, but then Indra got this astra, which was made with the body of Dadishi and which was uh, blessed by Narayan. and when ritrasur saw that he knew this is a weapon i can't counter so when he faced death right in front of him that's when the functional vision how oh, what is this that got disrupted and see what happens is when we say that our spiritual impressions are carried from one life to another purvabhyasena tenaiva riyate yavashopisa purva abhyas what we have done in na previous lives that comes over spontaneously to the next life now that is true but that doesn't mean it will happen uh, right from birth it's no matter even if our soul is very very advanced and that soul is born next life as a baby it's not likely that the baby even comes out of the mother womb the baby will be saying hare krishna no based on the 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 soul is encased in a particular body at that time so naturally the soul will cry but then when circumstantially a soul is exposed to to bhakti to some spiritual stimuli then just take it up take it up with fascination i was in brisbane just a few months ago and i met one devotee i normally when we meet devotees he is australian so i asked him how do you how did were you introduced he said his introduction was through the sanskrit syllabus he said he read the devanagari he is or searching something on the internet and he saw the devanagari script he saw he said this is fascinating what is this he is so captivated by that he says what is this what is written in this i want to learn more about this and he searched around who can teach me sanskrit who can teach me more about sanskrit and he went to the local temple and he found that he was really disappointed because nobody knew sanskrit over there So then they said you like, can they there somebody is going to Vrindavan he went to Vrindavan and met Gopi Bharanand Prabhu who is a very scholarly Prabhupada disciple and it is like people take years to learn sanskrit within just a few months he's so captivated he said that i have never feel attracted to english script the way i am attracted to sanskrit they were not script so that when a situation came up that captivation that attraction arose so that attraction toward the transcendental even if it is impressed within us it may require a particular situation when it is brought out so for vitrasur that facing death was a situation when it came up so so the first point i discussed was how we we, we all see the same thing but we don't see the same thing because our vision is functional and based on what is important what matters for us we all see different, differently the second point i was going to make is that how you know what one vision sees as a shelter another vision sees as a fetter sees as a restrictor sees as a prison <coughs> i was in new zealand and there was one devotee has a this person has become a devotee he has a construction company and he was showing me his uh, company website and the slogan over there was like some people have mottos so it says our houses are as comfortable as your mother's womb <laughs> now you are just very newly introduced to krishna consciousness so probably he has not heard about the third canto and all that 
but then i was talking with a devotee doctor and actually it now if you consider from the biological perspective the mother's womb is designed by nature to be a very safe and comfortable place it is from the perspective if we consider the baby to be like a like a biological bag that be that is enough protection of course the mother also has to take care but for the small for the various shocks and jerks that might come the womb is a comfortable place but if we consider that the baby is a conscious being then for a conscious being to be constricted in a very small cramped space that is not at all comfortable so from a biological perspective yes the womb is a comfortable place nature designs i think it's a way that to maximize the possibility of survival and the baby is so tender that the basic level of comfort is there so what will seem comfortable in one vision the biological vision will seem uncomfortable in another vision that is the vision of a conscious being being there so similarly if we consider at various levels what one person may consider as a shelter another person may consider as an attachment now what do i mean by this that is what one person may think as a shelter another may see as attachment that if we consider a small bird the birds are said to be dwija they are born twice so first they are born inside the mother shell inside no inside the shell then the, the shell basically the basically the mother gives out the egg and they are born inside that now for the baby birds the shell is an essential shelter and if they are prematurely brought out of the shell then they can't live they can't survive just like if a baby is prematurely born then you need to replicate the conditions that were in the mother's womb so that can survive so the shell is a protector for the for the uh, baby bird but when the bird has grown up sufficiently then it has to come out of the shell and there is a laborious process for that it's a painful process the bird has to break the nest and it breaks in the next so not the nest the shell it cracks a little bit and then it it's a little wing comes out and the wing flaps again then the shell cracks on its closes back on its wings and it is in pain and then it pushes again just like when the baby comes out of the mother's womb it's the labor is a painful process so the labor is a laborious process so basically we could say that there is one level of order which is inside the shell or inside the womb and there is another level of order which is outside and we could say the the for the baby life outside the womb for the bird outside life outside the shell is much bigger much freer much brighter but you cannot go from inside the womb or shell to outside before the right time and to go from here to there requires disruption so basically we could say there is order then there is order at one level and there is order at another level to go from order at one level to order at another level in between there is chaos in basically order means what order means when we do something and we expect a particular result and that result comes chaos means that what we do and what result comes there is no predictability See, all of you are sitting in this class peacefully every one of you is almost 100% confident that suddenly the person next to you is not going to turn at you and slap you in the face <laughs> now you could say it's possible but it's not probable and that level of order is essential so that you can focus and hear <coughs> say if you are traveling in a crowded local and there you want to hear a class and somebody just that elbow digs into your chest and then you cannot concentrate at that so there is order then there is another level of order and in between there is chaos so similarly for us we usually live within various material shelters 
so we live in the shelter say i belong to this i am a member of this family i am belong i am a member of this community i am a member of this state i am a member of this country so when that order is threatened when chaos comes up when the order is threatened that's where we think about some higher order and try to go towards that higher order recently this cricket world cup was going on and uh, I was in Australia at that time, so I was in touch with a devotee friend in London. So he was telling me that his friend had come from India to London just for the India-Pakistan cricket match. And at that time, there was the fear that there would be heavy rains. There was rains going on, and the match might get wiped out. So he had purchased uh, the tickets, and it was something like uh, he purchased a ticket for two thousand pounds. it's almost like nearly 2 lakh rupees one ticket and he said this friend was a atheist but he was also praying you know please there be no rain the when the match take place <laughs> so what happens when the existing order doesn't work so you go for a cricket match and there is what you expect is i'll be able to see the match over there but when there is chaos oh the match didn't take what happened so uh, india was expected to defeat new zealand but when we, we got defeated this chaos so now there are hundreds of articles doing post mortem analysis you know what went wrong what went wrong what went wrong so it's like you know everybody is expert at giving advice in fact there is no charity that we give as freely as advice <laughs> <laughs> so what seems or what seems a shelter at one level so for a bird when it is inside the when it is tender it needs to be inside the womb inside the shell for the baby needs to be inside the womb but then it has to come out so similarly for us we live inside certain shelters certain functional visions of life which give us some shelter and to go from that shelter to another level of shelter that requires the disruption of our existing order it's only when the existing order is disrupted then it's like this is order this is chaos and this is order so we have to go through chaos to the order but the challenge is so when we are trying to this event people are living within their own particular conceptions of life and we want to get them to come to the krishna conscious conception yes you may have many shelters but krishna is your ultimate shelter and take shelter of krishna so to some extent whenever we are sharing krishna consciousness it is see <coughs> preaching means to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comforted so that means if somebody's existing order is already disrupted and then oh they are already afflicted then give them you know this has gone wrong that has gone wrong then give them the shelter that actually krishna is still in charge that krishna is still with you and give them a perception of a higher order and that's how comfort the afflicted and then sometimes if somebody is comfortably situated inside their own shell and they don't want to come out then we have to afflict the comfort this shell is not going to be as it is as you think it is going to be so but what may happen is if we break the shell if we try to break the shell and that breaking of the shell involves creating some chaos but the purpose of that chaos is to get them to a higher level of order to to get them from the lower shelter to the higher shelter but if this is not done carefully then what happens is that people because this chaos is very very difficult to navigate and if during that chaos there's not proper guidance not proper support not proper encouragement then people basically lose we break this shelter and instead of coming to this higher level of shelter they go down further into a further chaos say for example if somebody is say worshiping uh, a particular <coughs> they a particular uh, particular conception of god so there are demigods and there are semigods so semigods are say me god 
<laughs> I am God. <laughs> so there are people who claim like that. Now, when somebody is worshipping someone like that, now we may say that no, this is this is not correct. And we may want to get them to worship Krishna. But the intention is good. But if somebody starts saying, you say, no, no, this is not God, Krishna is God, and they get confused. And if we have not developed enough, we have not helped them create faith, then they may say this religion business is very confusing. Now different people claim, this is God, this is God, uh, I will have nothing to do with religion. And they become materialists and atheists. So they had some order here, we wanted to get them to this higher level of order. But if we disrupt their order and they go down to a lower level of disorder, a greater disorder or a very small, much smaller order, then we are not doing service, we are doing disservice. So many times when devotees are mm, preaching, I don't like the word preaching also because it is such a preachy word. It, it seems as if you are putting yourself in a higher position and preaching. But whenever we are going to share Krishna consciousness, at that time, we often uh, say, no, okay, so I brought this person to Krishna. So many people came to Krishna because of me. So many people, I made so many people into devotees. So sometimes as preachers, we may become proud of that. And we may keep a track of so many people may become devotees. But who among us keeps track of how many people didn't come to Krishna because of me? <laughs> sometimes we might have disrupted the way they conceived and they thought of things. And because of that, they may have gone away from Krishna. So, Krishna says, Na buddhi bhedam janaye ajnanam karma sangina Joshaye sarva karmani vidwan yukta samachar He says, Na buddhi bhedam janaye Do not disturb the minds of people. It's interesting, this is 326 in the Bhagavad Gita. Prabhupada translates it as mind, but the Sanskrit word is buddhi. Na buddhi bhedam. Bheda means to, to divide, to create holes. Na buddhi bhedam janaye Agyanam karma sangina. Even if people are ignorant and attached, Agyanam karma sangina. Still, na buddhidam. Don't disturb. What? Based on people's minds, how their mind is, they acquire certain conceptions. And often people use their intelligence to justify uh, whether to justify whatever they are doing. Say if somebody is walking and they slip and fall down. Now for many people if they fall down, it's like they're, they're, nothing is injured, but their pride is injured. So, I will say, hey, did you fall down? He says, no, no, I was just checking whether gravity is still working. <laughs> that is, you know, you're denying reality. So, if somebody, if say an airplane crashes, and then the, the airline does the investigation and then they decide. They come over, why did the airplane crash? It crashed because of gravity. <laughs> That's not an explanation, isn't it? Yeah, gravity is always there. In spite of gravity, it has to work. So what happens is based on the conceptions that people have, people use their intelligence to justify the existing order that they are in. And they don't want it disrupted. That's why, although it is, is na, Sanskrit is na buddhi bhedam janayit. And Prabhupada uses the word mind. Say, don't disturb people's minds. Based on how people's minds, for most people, their intelligence doesn't control their mind. Their intelligence obeys their mind. That means what I feel, I use my intelligence to justify that. Therefore, na buddhi bhedam janayit. So anyway, the point I was making is that, when we disrupt people's existing level of order, no, we need to take responsibility to take them to a higher level of order. Otherwise, we simply disrupt their order and they end up going to a lower level of order. I remember, maybe 20, again 20, 25 years ago, I was just introduced to Krishna consciousness, maybe a year or so. So there is what is called the zeal of the new convert, where you want to convert everyone else. So I used to work in a company and one of my, from the same college, <coughs> there was another student who had also joined the same, who had also been hired in the same company. So we used to go by bus. So I, my, my stop was a little before him and his stop was two stops afterwards. They would join. 
and it is about one hour ride on the bus so usually i would chant or i would read or i hear something i would, that time all these are people are materialistic not to spend time talking with them so then this friend one day made the big mistake of asking me what are you doing <laughs> and then you know the next 45 minutes <laughs> I gave him a concentrated six session course of the Bhagavad Gita, <laughs> starting from you know how God exists, evidence for God's existence, evidence for soul's existence, evidence for karma, evidence for how this world is dukkhalaya, evidence for how Krishna alone is the supreme personality of Godhead, how chanting is the Yuga Dharma, and you know I was figuratively patting myself on the back, you know how intelligently I concentrated the whole six session course in 45 minutes. <laughs> And then I didn't even notice that his eyes were glazing. Head is, yes. and then after that, whenever he would he would enter that bus, you know, the only bus has two doors. So he would peep into the door, look at where I was sitting, and enter from the door far away from me. <laughs> so recently I was in Seattle. Uh, yeah, in Seattle only. And then his sister has now become a devotee. So probably his sister undid the damage that I did at that time. <laughs> so then he had come to meet me and then both of us, we remembered and then I apologized to him for that. So he was laughing. So for him, it was just a casual inquiry. I didn't have to give like a complete philosophical dose to him at that time. So we need to present Krishna consciousness in a way that can help people rise from where they are to the next level. So what might seem like an attachment for someone? At one level, oh you are attached to your worldly way of living. Okay, but that is giving them the shelter at that particular point. Now if we are going to disrupt somebody's existing shelter, we have to be there to help them rise to a higher level of shelter. If we are simply going to disrupt shelter, then we may be well doing disservice to people. So of course, Krishna is ultimately there and we don't do anything. It is Krishna who does through us and through others. So we need to understand that we can't just dismiss people as saying, you are attached. No, that's, that might be what shelters them at that particular point in life. And from that point, for them to rise to a higher point, it might require a gradual process. Some people can go rapidly, some people may go slowly. But we just can't disrupt people's existing order and leave at that. We have to help them rise to a higher level of order. And I'll conclude. This was the second point that what seems like shelter to one can seem uh, what can can be like can be seen like a, what seems like entanglement for one can be like a shelter for other. So I'll go to the third point and then we can have some questions. So now last point I was going to say is that we need to intelligently for ourselves as well as for others rise from our existing shelter to a higher shelter. What does that mean? That <coughs> we look, let's look at the past time of Dhruva Maharaj. <coughs> Dhruva was just a small five-year-old boy and he was insulted. And when he went to the forest, he was so hurt, so angered because his father had neglected him and his stepmother had derided him and mocked him. Actually, his stepmother mocking him His stepmother mocking him did not affect him as much as his father neglecting him. The children are very perceptive, the small children. Sometimes if you come into a room, if there are two people and there is some tension between them, it's almost you can, uh, you can perceive that the atmosphere in this room is tense. So sometimes you enter into a room, it, it appears like you are walking into a landmine. And there might be no specific word that anybody has spoken, but you can, you can sense the tension in the room. And just as we can perceive that, the small children can perceive that. So there is a tension between Suruchi and Suniti. And even Dhruva as a small five-year-old boy could perceive that. So Suruchi speaking harshly to him didn't hurt him that much. Because that was to be expected. But when his father neglected him, did not stop her. Stop. That was what hurt him the most. 
there. This is the harshest words of our critics. Don't hurt us as much as the silence of our friends. Critics, that's what they're going to do. They're going to criticize. But our friends, we hope, we expect that they will defend us. So basically for Dhruva, he was living a comfortable life in his home and suddenly that order was disrupted. It's chaos. Now when that chaos came up, at that time his mother realized that I can't, I can't resolve this for you. Now his anger was directed towards his father. He said, you did not allow me to sit on your lap. I will get a not just sit on your lap, I will sit on the throne that you are sitting. And not just on the throne you are sitting, <coughs> I will sit on a bigger throne. I will get a kingdom bigger than yours and sit on that throne. So then he started, he, his mother told him, I cannot help you. But that same Lord who helps all living beings, will go and take shelter of you. How oh, he was ready to go through all the chaos for a small child, to go into the forest at the age of five, all alone, it requires a lot of courage. When he went there, at that time, Narad Muni. Narad Muni is, uh, is almost omnipresent in the Bhagavatam. He is like Krishna. Wherever he is needed, he is there. Of course, many people feel he is not needed also. Kamsa thought that he was not needed. Why is he coming here? But Narad Muni is always there. So Narad Muni immediately came there. And when he came there, uh, what happened is, Narad Muni first told him that you are a small child and children sometimes get teased, they quarrel and then they resolve. Sometimes it was two children quarrel and then when they quarrel they say, Kati, I am never going to talk with you. And the next day they are playing together. So they don't take it very seriously, he says you are a child. Children, just small things happen, don't take it very seriously. Or, if you think you are adult, then those who are really mature, they understand that honor and dishonor keep coming and going in this world. So just tolerate this and dishonor, go back and everything will be alright. So now, Dhruva, he said the words that you have spoken are right but they are not right for me. I have been so terribly hurt that I cannot just tolerate this dishonor. I want to solve this. I want a kingdom bigger than me. Better bigger than what uh, my father has. If you can help me, please help me. Otherwise, let me go my way. So basically what happened is you could say that Dhruva's anger was material. Dishonor in that situation was simply a material emotion. But when Narad Muni offered him the shelter which was too high for him to take, it was too too high for him to take, then he couldn't take that shelter. And he said, I can't take it. Except traditionally, many of the temples are say on top of hills, like if you have Tirupati or others. Now, of course, we may have buses to go up. But in the past, if you had to go to take Darshan of Tirupati, you had to climb up. And that's quite tiring. But those who are devoted, they are ready to take that climb. But Prabhupada, when he was asked, you know, what is the most suited place for a temple? He said, that which is most accessible to people. Where most people can easily come. So the idea is that those who are devoted, they will take that huge leap up. But most people are not that devoted. And then we can't expect them to take that big leap. We have to help them take baby steps forward. The whole point of having temples in the cities, having many, many centers in different parts of the world and different parts within the cities also, is that people can easily come, easily come. So for Dhruva, this order to that order, this disorder. This order was, oh, you're comfortable in your home and just tolerate this honor, this honor. He said, I can't do that. It is too big a leap for him. When it was too big a leap, and Dhruva could have taken that leap. He said, oh, Narad is giving instruction. How can I disobey? 
But he did not do that because he knew he would not be able to sustain it. And he says, this instruction is not right for me. And when he was candid like that, then Narakuni gave him an order in between. What was that? See, there are basically we can approach God with two moods. And devotion itself has these two moods. One is to transform the world and the other is to transcend the world. So, devotion has this world transcending and world transforming aspects. And we see these two very dramatically in the contrast of the emphasis in, in Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita. The Bhagavad Gita is spoken to Arjuna who has to fight a war to establish Dharma in the world. And when Arjuna says, I will renounce the world, Krishna says, no, Dharma samsthapana, you have to help, help you to establish Dharma. So the Bhagavad Gita's entire focus is on transforming the world, acting in the world to cre recreate some order in the world which has been disrupted, to create a pious, virtuous, dharmic order in the world. The Bhagavatam is spoken to someone who has already renounced the world and that person is already accepted that I am going to die in seven days. So then he just renounces the world and focuses on hearing the Bhagavatam. That is world transcending. Now for most of us, our life is like a, you could say a wedding of both of these. There is some situations we need to transcend the world. So for example, when we are doing sadhana, Say when we are doing our japa or when we are hearing a class. At that time, you know, if a class goes for one hour, he'll be anxious. How many messages have come on my phone? Say, I want to check it. Many of us are like that. So, but I, I gave a class in Denver University on do you need to break up with your phone? You know, people have this idea of breaking up in their relationships. So do you need to break up with your phone? So I was asking the students over there, do you need to, uh, do you feel... Are there any times when you have very seriously been distracted from something important because of the phone? So many of them give such incidents. You know, most common is you are driving a car and then you get distracted because a message comes up. So it's, it's so basically the point I'm making by this example is that there are some times when we need to trans transcend the world. Just put aside the distractions. But there is we are also serving in this world. Not only do we have most, uh, not only do we have our response, our families and our jobs, but even as devotees, when we are serving Krishna in this world, we are trying to spread His mission. At that time, we need to focus on transforming the world. Transforming the world means doing what is required to make changes in the world. So we need to know. So, for example, this is the order over here. I say we have a particular order is that. The order is that, okay, I have my family, I have my job, I have my temple, I have this, 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 and this is how my life is going on. And the higher order is that ultimately Krishna is in control of everything. So now, there is a, we could say a practical level of order that is also required for us to serve Krishna. And sometimes the practical order is disrupted and we take shelter of the ultimate order. Krishna, nothing is working, I take shelter of it. But for our day-to-day -day functioning, we have to we have to maintain the order. Say for example, now all of you have come for class. Now after class there is prasad. If prasad is not there, that is a disorder. Isn't it? Oh, what happened? I'm hungry. So somebody has to take care of that so that the prasad comes on time. So we cannot just and uh, we cannot be we cannot transcend the world when we are meant to transform the world. Uh, long ago, I was given a, when 20, again, 20, 25 years ago, when I started speaking about Krishna, I was given by a senior devotee 10 guidelines about how to speak in public for Krishna. So the last guideline was depend on Krishna. It is in bracket, but only after you have prepared your class. <laughs> so, if I can't, I may be speaking about depending on Krishna, but I have to prepare the class. So preparing means transforming, transforming my thoughts so that they are in a proper order. So there are situations for most of us in our life, we need to have our present level of order established and restored so that we can practice bhakti. But we don't want to be restricted to this level of order. We don't know that there is a higher order also 
and this order is meant to help me go towards the higher order just like say for a child there are parents now children who are without parents or say are in single parent families or whatever it's very difficult for them to have normal psychological growth so the normal family structure is very important that's a order but if the parents are devotees and the parents and help children to also at least get its impressions of krishna then this is the order that facilitates the higher order but if the parents are godless in fact there are some atheists who are super aggressive they are not atheists they are antitheists they are on a mission against god and they say that you know for parents to pass on their religious beliefs to their children is child abuse and it's it's like that in uk especially uk is among uk has one of the world's most aggressive antitheists so they're saying that parents don't have the right to indoctrinate their children like that well yeah we children also have their own choice and they will grow up and make their choices in due course but you cannot just leave the children to do whatever they want parents have to discipline and guide their children so there has to be an existing order but that order should be such that it facilitates the higher order so for all of us we need to wisely know when to transform our existing situation so that the order is restored and when to transcend the existing situation to rise to a higher order and <clears throat> this can be done in three broad ways which I'll conclude this talk i call this as <clears throat> basically when our existing order is being disrupted so we have three options tolerate mitigate or emigrate so <laughs> tolerate let's say for example if we are traveling in a local and while traveling in a local at that time it's a local has capacity of 50 people but there are 300 people in that local is squeezed and then in every group of people there are always some bullies so say we are standing and so the person next to us is pushing us you think you think you are so you are a boss i'll show you what i am we push them back and they push us and we push them back and they push us and we push them back and we get so caught in pushing and counter pushing that our station comes and goes <laughs> we are still pushing you know that is ludicrous so it's a small thing okay you want to show off your strength i just move somewhere it's just half an hour right i'll try so at that time tolerate so tolerate means what keep small things small so that you can focus on the big thing so the uh, so the the, the, the the order is that we are all sitting in that car we are all in that train standing in that train and the order is that we want to go to our destination so there is some disruption in that order but tolerate it's a small thing the small thing is how comfortable we are in that situation the big thing is whether we get to our destination or not so keep small things small so that we can focus on the big things but suppose that person starts pushing us not just pushing us but pushing us out of the tree then we can't tolerate that because there is no longer a small thing it's interfering with the big thing so then we have two options either mitigate mitigate means you know we maybe call we may call out to other people for help call out at tc or do something to counter that situation or if say to me that that person is like a part of a gang and that everybody else is ganging up with them then you might just go to another coach so immigrate so either we can mitigate or we can immigrate so similarly for us when we go through difficulties see we all have certain basically whenever we face any difficulty that means we have certain vision we have certain attachment based on that vision and that is being disrupted so now what do i do at that time so at that time what do i do is that uh, i have to find out what is my big purpose my big purpose and focus on that big purpose we focus on that big purpose and the small purpose the small thing even if it has gone wrong it doesn't matter that much it doesn't matter that much so we keep the small things small so that we can focus on the big things and when we when we have this vision of focusing on the big thing then 
we can decide whether to tolerate, to mitigate, or to emigrate. So when the order is disrupted, so at that time, how best should I work to restore this order, or should I just transcend this? Should I try to transform the situation, restore the order over here, or should I decide that this just can't be transcended? This can't be transformed. So let me just transcend the situation. So we could say tolerating is like transcending the situation. Just leave it as it is. Okay, it is by Krishna's arrangement that the situation is like this. So we need to have that expertise to know when to tolerate and when to mitigate or integrate. And that's where I said we need to be wise, we need to be expert. So I was at a <coughs> I was at a program in Harvard University, and there after that one one Hindu boy had come. He was like a little skeptical. So before that, somebody had come and given there a fire and brimstone kind of class on karma. So he so said, you know, if you so they said, you know, if you kill animals, you will become an animal and you will be killed. You will be slaughtered. If you slaughter animals, you will be slaughtered. So if you if somebody slaughters cows, they will become cows and they will be slaughtered. So this boy asked this question, and the previous time when the, he had asked the question. It is like the whole program had been reduced to a laughing stock and the, the speaker had become very embarrassed by that. So he said his question was that now if you say that if you slaughter cows then you will become a cow in your next life and you will be slaughtered. That means that all those who are cows now, they were cow slaughterers in their previous life. So what's wrong in them being slaughtered now? Yeah. Now this is this is in, in logic it is called the error of the antecedent. <laughs> error of the antecedent means what? If A then B. But that doesn't mean if B then A. That means say if it rains the pavement will be wet. If A then B. <coughs> but if the pavement is wet that doesn't necessarily mean it has rained. It could be that there was a water there's a leakage over somewhere or somebody was carrying some buckets of water and some water spilled over. It could be that there was a garden which was being uh, watered and some water went over over there so unless you can prove that b come b is only causes a you cannot infer if b then a so yes those who slaughter animals the principle of karma is that whatever wrong we have done that wrong we will be accountable for that and this idea that if we are we kill animals we will become animals that is indicative the law of karma is gahana karma it's not necessary that each time it has to happen that way so the point is that if a soul is in a cow's body, if a soul is in a cow's body right now, we have no knowledge that how that soul has come in the cow's body. It could be that the soul has evolved over many lifetimes. It could be that the soul is a devotee of the Lord and is in a body that is very dear to the Lord. It could, we don't know. So for us, and we, we can't judge people based on their previous lives. We have to function with people based on the order that is there in this life. So, in this case, the order is disrupted. And we are trying to protect animals, especially cows. And that protection is not there, that order needs to be restored. So, we need to have the right vision. The right vision is that in this case, we have to do what we can to help Krishna, to assist Krishna in establishing that one. So, some, so here, we, rather than focusing on what is whose karma, we have to focus on what is my dharma. Not what is whose karma, but what is my dharma. So sometimes our dharma is that, okay, things are such that we can't do anything about it. We just have to tolerate. But if we have the power to change, then we need to change. So uh, there, there has to be order in this world. So Krishna, if you see 6, 7, 8 in the Bhagavad Gita, he says Dharma Samsthapana, I can't come to establish Dharma. That is transforming the world. And 9, after that is, 4, 4 chapter 9, 4, I'm talking about 7, 8, 9, 4, 9, 4, 9 is Janma Karma Chame Divyam Evam Yovet Tattvata Tyaktva Deham Punan Janma Naitimame Tiso Arjuna. So this is talking about transcending the world. You become absorbed in me and you retain me. So Krishna has both these purposes, to transform the world and to transcend the world. Prabhupada was in Vrindavan and he was transcendental and he could have stayed transcendental. <coughs> but Prabhupada came from Vrindavan, left Vrindavan to go to America. 
actually that's an incorrect understanding prabhupada did not leave vrindavan to go to america prabhupada carried vrindavan with him to america and wherever he went he created replicas of vrindavan he created replicas of vaikuntha but he was on a mission for transforming the world and tirelessly he went across traveling traveling transforming the world and then when he his body completely bro- although his body was old still he went about in the mission of transforming the world but eventually when his body literally broke down could do much then he again returned to vrinda and then he told the devotees don't disturb me with any managerial issues now. till that point devotees would write for him from various parts of the world and he would respond to them hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of letters prabhupada gave him practical guidance he was focusing at that time on transforming the world but then when he want in the last time came just disconnected from everything transcend the world so our practice of bhakti has to be a dynamic dance of world transcending and world transforming so when we have to transcend the world and when we should transform the world so if we are working at our jobs we are working at taking care of a family that time our mind starts saying you know i want to go to the temple i want to chant i want to read shastra yes there is a time for that i'll do that but right now this is let me do this in the mood of service to krishna this is world transforming and then when we come to the temple when we are doing our japa when we are doing our puja when we are doing our shastra study at that time oh i have to do this i have to do that i have to do that our mind will say that no okay all those things i will do later so our mind messes with our bhakti by making us want to transcend when we are meant to transform and making us transform when we are meant to transcend but that's why if we are wise if we are intelligent if our intelligence is sharp we know when to transcend and when to transform so when we learn this expertly then our devotion will become like a dynamic dance you know doing what is required at the right time but through it all moving towards krishna consistency okay, so if we focus too much at transforming or too much at transcending then our devotion will become imbalanced but balance means to know when to transcend when to transform and that way although our life will have ups and downs but we will be able to find our way towards krishna steadily and ultimately when we become absorbed in krishna and at the end of our lives if our love for krishna has become more than our love for the world then krishna will take us out of this world to his eternal abode so i'll summarize i spoke on this topic today about how to how to foster cultivate the vision that will nurture devotion so i talked about first the relativity of vision that we all see the same thing but we don't see the same thing our vision is functional we have a low resolution picture of things based on not what it is made of but what matters to us not what is matter but what matters and that applies to gadgets that applies even to people and that applies to the world so in our functional vision there may not be any place for god or there may be a small place for god but when that functional vision is disrupted that order is disrupted then we start thinking of something higher <coughs> so then i talked about how what can seem like a shelter seem like a bondage for one person attachment for one person can be like a shelter for another so there is order at one level there is order at another level but in between there is chaos so for a baby or a baby bird the womb or the nest are order and it's needed for a particular time but then beyond that time that order starts suffocating so to, the transition from the order through chaos to order requires expert assistance expert guidance so when we are preaching one part is that we need to disrupt people's existing order but also we need to raise them to a higher level of order if we only disrupt their existing order then they may go down to a lower level of disorder and then we are doing this service we may count how many people came to krishna because of me but how many people didn't come to krishna because of me that is also an important thing to keep track of so don't disturb people's minds krishna says that means that don't disrupt people's existing order without raising them to <coughs> higher level of order and then how to raise others or ourselves to a higher level of order we talked about how there is two aspects to devotion world transforming and world transcending world transforming means that we try to restore order at this at this world level and 
The word transcending means we just focus on the ultimate order that Krishna is in charge. So the Bhagavad Gita has the mood of world transformation, the Bhagavatam the mood of world transcending. And we all need to know which vision, which vision to adopt, to when, when to transform, when to transcend. I talk about tolerate, mitigate and immigrate. So tolerate is like this transcend, existing order, okay. Mitigate and immigrate means we transform. And we talked about how Dhruva, when he was given a very high level of order to seek, he said, I can't do that. I can't just tolerate. So then he was given a devotional vision, but with a transforming focus. He was guided by Narmuni to attain a big kingdom by which he could transform. And then he became, when he transformed, he transcended. He was so satisfied by that connection with Krishna. So for all of us, in our personal practice of bhakti, balance means to know when we should focus on transforming the world and when on transcending the world. When we have that sense of purpose of connecting with Krishna, then our life will become like a dynamic expert dance of transforming and transcending through which all we will move towards increasing our attachment of, to Krishna and ultimately attaining Krishna. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Are there any questions or comments? Okay. Over there. Yeah. Yes. preferences what, what what is how much to engage in world transformation and how much to engage in world transcending yes in general in conflict resolution there is a principle every story has how many sides any idea yes not two sides three sides my side your side and the right side <laughs> <laughs> So basically, you know, there is no one answer to this. That see, conservatives basically they say that let's maintain the existing order. The way things were, we should continue them because they are working and they have worked. And those who are liberal, they say actually, but they're not working. You see, this is not working, this is not working, this is not working. So we need to make changes. Now, what now Prabhupada himself was he conservative, was he liberal? He was both. And the fact that he uh, went to the West, that itself indicates that he was not ultra-conservative. Because traditionally sannyasis are not meant to, uh, it is according to some injunctions that sannyasis are not meant to cross oceans and go to the places where there are a lot of contamination. Prabhupada went there. Prabhupada spent time with people and initiated and elevated people who were, you know, the hippies, see, in India, at least traditional Indian culture, the Western people were considered degraded. But the hippies were considered degraded even by western standards. So they were considered degraded by the degraded. And Prabhupada spent time with them, Prabhupada cooked with them, Prabhupada washed their plates. Prabhupada accommodated them in hundreds of ways. So we can't say Prabhupada was only conservative. Prabhupada was liberal in many ways to accommodate people. So rather than getting into this controversy of conservative and liberal, we have to see what is effective, what is purposeful. What helps people to connect with Krishna the best? So it's like we could say that life, our life journey, at, we could say at an organizational level, it's like a winding path. It's like there is, there is a winding mountain path 
with steep falls on both sides. So sometimes the path is winding towards the right and sometimes the path is winding towards the left. So some things they need to be kept as they are. So you could say moving towards the right is the conservatives. You know? Let's keep things as they are. Moving towards the left is the liberals. Change things. So now should we change or should we keep things as they are? We have to do what will take us along the path. If the path is moving towards the left, then we have to move towards the left. If the path is moving towards the right, we need to move towards the right. So now how do we know? In life, you can't really see the path ahead of you clearly. We don't know the future, but we have to pool the best intelligence together and based on discussion, understand. That's why having discussions, respectful discussions is very important. Whenever there are differences of opinion, uh, see when discussions stop, it is not that the confrontation stops. The there are differences, there are differences, there are discussions and then there is destruction. So when discussion stops, the differences don't stop. The differences grow so much that destruction happens. So therefore, there has to be regular discussions. And so then sometimes the conservatives are right, sometimes the liberals are right. So if both of them have a respectful discussion with each other, then we can move forward. And Prabhupada said that our love will be sh for him will be shown by how we cooperate. Now cooperate at, at the most basic level we could say. Cooperate can also mean co-operate. You know, you do this, I will do this. I will operate here, you operate there. But let's cooperate. At least don't criticize each other. You know, ultimately, everybody is here to go toward Krishna and take others toward Krishna. So, if a particular method of getting people toward Krishna works, then that's wonderful. Others will also take it up. If something is not working, and then something else has to be done, Prabhupada did that. Prabhupada was in America, and he was, the American preaching model was basically make people into full-time devotees. But when he came to India, nobody was interested in moving into the temple and becoming a full-time devotee at that time. And Prabhupada created something new, life membership. So Prabhupada was dynamic. So whatever works, whatever connects people to Krishna, we need to do that. And rather than getting too caught in criticizing each other, we need to focus on just doing something constructive. And wherever we can connect and explain, that is good. But it's only through discussion based on the understanding the purpose. The purpose is to move forward on the path. And we have to discern whether the path is going toward the left or toward the right. So when there are, when there are, when there are discussions respect, in a respectful setting, then this can be resolved. Thank you. Yes, two. That's same. That's same. Okay. And what if someone takes shelter of the transactional vision to enhance his spiritual vision? Let us say, for example, uh, there is a student and he tries to, I mean, he wants to wake up at the very crack of the dawn to perform his, uh, his morning puja rituals or something like that. But he is not able to get up uh, early to do that. And uh, when he, I mean, he thinks that, uh, uh, let me uh, just wake up for uh, some uh, study. And he wakes up uh, very early in the morning and uh, do, does his studies and then he does his puja or something which was. So in that sense, he's uh, having some transactional vision or uh, functional vision uh, and then he's moving towards uh, his ideal spiritual goals. So, okay. uh, yeah. That's so again he's taking shelter of the functional vision, but we have to transform or transcend. Okay, so yeah. if we have having a particular order, if we use it for functional purposes only and not for transitional, transaction, transcendent, transcending or elevating our consciousness, the two don't necessarily have to be contradictory. They can be complementary also. In the material, there is sattva, rajas and tamas. Goodness, passion and ignorance. So much of what is in goodness is very favourable for practicing bhakti. Much of what is in ignorance is quite unfavourable for practicing bhakti. So, if the existing order is in ignorance, then it definitely has to be disrupted. If somebody's existing order is that, like, 
they are sleeping at 4 o'clock and waking up at 10 o'clock in the morning. Well, that is not so healthy. From, even from the material perspective, what is because spiritual perspective? But if somebody already had a habit of waking up early and then, then they were doing their studies. Okay, you can study but do something spiritual also. So we don't have to indiscriminately reject any particular order that we have. We have to use the expertly understand okay how much of this order can I use for my devotional purposes and which part I need to I need to now put it aside and rise. So it doesn't have sometimes the two can be contradictory, but quite often they can be complementary also. And if they are complementary, then that's very good. Because then devotion is not practicing devotion is not that much of a disruption in our day-to-day -day life. It's more of a, a progression rather than a disruption. Thank you. You had a question? Yeah, you can speak, I'll repeat. Yeah. Uh, you said that uh, one should not disturb the order that uh, a person is having unless you have a better order to give it. But what if one says that whatever a person is doing should not be done and there are other way, better ways to, be, to do it and the other person is also somewhat convinced about it and after disrupting the earlier order, the other order being told is also not convincing to them. What is the right thing which should have been uh, told by the person telling okay. and person? Good question. Say so somebody is not satisfied with their existing order, but uh, when we tell them about a higher order, they are not ready to accept that also. So what do you do? Yes. It's like I was say I invited a friend to come for a, I was in America in New York. So I had an old friend. I invited him to come for a program. So he said, a definite maybe. <laughs> a definite maybe. That means maybe I'll come, but a definite maybe. That's an oxymoron. You know, two opposite words you use together. So basically, some people they are not satisfied with the way things are but we offer them something higher they are not ready to take that also so it's actually very easy to point out what is wrong but to accept what is right that requires a leap of faith and that is not so easy to take for most people and because it is not so easy to take it will require mm, some you could say growing pain that means if somebody rejected this order, but they don't want to rise to that order, then they will have to go through that chaos. And we can help them go through that chaos, but sometimes they may not just be ready to help. So we can always now we can always work with our best intentions. But we don't have to deliberately disrupt people's existing order. Sometimes what can we do? We disrupt the order and they don't rise to a higher order. Our per we give them both, but they rejected the lower level, but they didn't take the higher level. So then that is, that is unfortunate. So this is something which we can try to avoid as much as possible. But ultimately people have to be uh, intelligent enough to recognize that they need some order in their life. And if that order is not there, then the life will become completely chaotic. And complete chaos is something which one just can't sustain for very long. Sometimes if we, can't, if we just maintain a cordial relationship with them, then maybe when that chaos, they find it too unbearable, too un then they will uh, come towards the higher order. So we can't control um, what, pe what choices people will make. But we can at least take the responsibility to make sure that they have a healthy choice available with them. See, we can only help the unable. We can't help the unwilling. There's a difference between the two. It likes say sometimes if we are driving a car and the car doesn't work, start. Then maybe some people come along and they push the car from outside. And then we are steering the car from inside and the car starts moving. So it's cooperative endeavor. But suppose that person is inside the car and they say the car is not moving. And then we come and push the car from outside. But the person from inside has gone to sleep. Or they are pressing the brake from inside then the person from outside why should they keep pushing isn't it so we, if somebody is unwilling then we just maintain a cordial relationship with them and leave it at that when they become willing we can help we have to know that we are limited beings as a Prabhupada also in his mark in Bhagavad Dharma says my dear lord tomara ichchaye sab hoi maya vash tomara ichchaye nash maya raparash 
that by it is by your will that others will come out of illusion so alankrita kori bara khamanta tomar that idea about please ornament my words so that they can become understandable to the uh, to these people so we can only do our part okay so thank you very much kantraj shrimad bhagavatam ki shrila prabhupad ki gaur bhakta vrind ki ताय गौर प्रेमानंदे